Good evening. On behalf of Wisconsin People Ideas Magazine, the Wisconsin Academy of Science, Arts, and Letters, and the Madison Public Library Foundation, I'm honored to welcome you to the 2021 Book Festival. Whether this is your first festival or you're a longtime participant, I'm glad you're here with us tonight. I'm Jason A. Smith, editor emeritus of Wisconsin People and Ideas Magazine. It's the quarterly magazine of the Wisconsin Academy of Sciences, Arts, and Letters. And I added that fancy title of emeritus since after 13 years of editing the magazine and administering its annual writing contests, I recently took a position at PBS Wisconsin. But I felt I needed to see through tonight's event, which is one of my favorite, one of the best things that the Academy does each year. While we've been hosting these events for the contest, a writing contest, annual writing contest since 1993, the Wisconsin Academy has been making a magazine for people who are curious about our world and proud of Wisconsin ideas since 1954. Wisconsin People and Ideas magazine features thoughtful stories about our people and culture, original creative writing and artwork, and informative articles about Wisconsin innovation. Of course, the magazine also provides opportunity and encouragement for Wisconsin writers through its annual fiction and poetry contests, the 2021 winners of which you'll hear from tonight. Well, as I mentioned, one of my favorite things to do at the magazine is to partner with the Wisconsin Book Festival to hold these annual poetry and fiction contests. Open to all Wisconsin residents and students age 18 or older, these contests offer prizes of up to $500 publication in Wisconsin People and Ideas Magazine, a one-week residency at the lovely Shake Rag Alley Center for the Arts in Mineral Point, and of course, a reading at the Wisconsin Book Festival in Madison. Our next contest submission window opens this coming January 15th, and we accept submissions online at wisconsinacademy.org slash contest, and of course, through USPS until March 15th. These contests are just one way the Wisconsin Academy supports Wisconsin writers. And that's why we're here tonight, to support our writers and to hear some incredible fiction and poetry from our 2021 contest winners. Now, of course, we couldn't hold a statewide contest of this magnitude or showcase these excellent Wisconsin writers without our contest supporters. And I'd again like to thank Shake Rag Alley Center for the Arts for providing each first place winner with a one week writer's residence in their lovely Mineral Point campus. We're also grateful to our friends at Wisconsin Public Radio for their promotional support of the contest. They really help us reach every corner of the state. This year, we received 88 fiction submissions for the contest, for the fiction contest, and a record 702 poems, which is amazing. So needless to say, I'm grateful for our contest judges, poet and former M Milwaukee Poet Laureate, Brenda Cardenas, and author Chris Fink, as well as our preliminary poetry screener, Jody Vandermolen, all of these judges deserve our appreciation for their thoughtful consideration of every single story and poem that passed before their eyes. There were a lot. So this reading tonight, of course, wouldn't exist without the efforts of Madison Public Library and the Madison Public Library Foundation. I wanna thank the dedicated people who helped to make the Wisconsin Book Festival happen, especially Director Connor Moran and all those who volunteer their time and efforts. So I think we're about ready to get going on our readings and I'm so excited to have our guests here tonight. I really look forward to hearing what they, what they read for us. We're gonna begin with, uh, with David Southard. David's poem, St. Simone, won second place in the 2021 festival. And I have to say, Paula Schulz was gonna be with, her, with us tonight, here with us tonight to read her third place award-winning poem, but she couldn't be with us. So David volunteered to go first um, so David's going to read to us St. Simone and a couple other poems, hopefully. David teaches at the Honors College and the University of Wisconsin-Madison. His publications include Bachelor Buttons and Apocrypha, two different publications, Bachelor Buttons and Apocrypha, Apocrypha a sonnet sequence based on the Gospels. David's a two-time winner of the Lorreen Niedecker Prize and was selected by Mark Doty for the Muse Prize from the Wisconsin Fellowship of Poets, a great organization. In 2019, his poem, Mary's Visit, received the Frost Farm Prize from Metrical Poetry. David resides in Milwaukee with his husband, Jeff, and he's here with us tonight. We're, we're glad to have him. Please welcome David Southard. Thank you so much, Jason. Uh, since I'll never get another chance to say this, I would like to start by thanking the Academy for this honor. 
Um, no, seriously, I, uh, I'm thrilled to be reading my work in the company of all these fine poets and storytellers. Um, I'm going to start with my winning poem, uh, which is about the French philosopher Simone Weil, whose work I became obsessed with while working on an article on religion and poetry. Curious fact about this poem, um, the first version was actually about Weil's metaphysics, but after it was trashed by my critique group for being too abstract, and, and rightfully so, um, I decided to write something more personal about the woman herself. Saint Simone. She starved herself thinking about grace, how difficult it was to be nothing but flesh, prickly, contrarious, pretending to get by on cigarettes and headaches. As a student, she witnessed the heedless velocity of factories of campaigns preparing to turn people into things. She called this force. Like any woman who has loved a man, she understood God's absence, the harrowing way loss can intensify passion. Denying herself the comforts of church or sect, she believed only in challenge, staring into the black waves of oblivion until they shimmered. My first collection, Bachelor's Buttons, came out during the pandemic, so I actually haven't had that many opportunities to read from it. Um, the opening poem was written after I learned that gargoyles were originally rain spouts on churches, and that word gargoyle is directly related to gargle. Gargoyles. Straining their necks to feel the sunlight, God's prisoners bear their teeth. They curse the architects whose spires they dwell beneath. Across their backs run troughs of stone designed to catch and filter rain through their open mouths. Shrieks of bubbled filthy pain are sometimes heard by children playing below who look, who look up and ask why God breeds such ugly birds and what they signify. The boy who knows has never thrown a ball as far or straight as others. He daydreams, unlike those athletes who, as brothers, work in a team and stands apart to watch their triumphs taking shape with his shoulders hunched in thought, his mouth agape. I love to write ekphrastic poetry or poems about artworks. Um, here is the painting that this next poem is about. It's a 15th century self-portrait by Albert Durer. Durer's self-portrait at 26. He catches you in the act of looking at the cleft fruit of his lips, at the insidiously tangled wavelets of corn silk hair cascading to his shoulder. A silvery link of rope secures his cape, drawn taut against the luminous hues of lean flesh. You think, here is a man who knows what he wants, who can face the sun of his own pride fearlessly. And isn't that a telltale mark of genius? Never to blink, squint, or look away from the blaze and lose oneself in shadows? My husband, Jeff, is a truly magnificent cook. In addition to his many other virtues, um, this sonnet is a tribute to him um, and incidentally was a regional winner for Wisconsin in the Mariah Faust sonnet contest. The chef at home, he bakes with love. The extra care it takes to blend two flowers for a flawless crumb enriches every layer of his cakes. His pie crusts, crimped with forefinger and thumb, are brushed with egg to gleam like Aztec gold. Banana bread, each slice a perfect sponge for tea, he'll make on mornings when it's cold, while evenings end with the unseemly plunge of forks through cheesecake. Guests come to be primed for heaven by the scent of his souffle, which tastes like friendship warmed. And once it's time to brown the custard skins of creme brulee, the sugar crystals show no signs of scorch, turning to caramel 
under his blue torch. Now for some more recent work. Um, once a year, I go back to Fort Myers, Florida, where I grew up, to visit my dad and stepmom, who I think are listening. Hey, guys. Um, this poem tries to capture the distinctively Floridian feel of their home, uh, which I might add is a lot nicer than the one I grew up in. <clears throat> Staying at dad's. Picture a house so quiet you hear time absorbing each day's measure of the sun. And through French doors, the tinkling of a chime to indicate that happy hours begun links day to day to week to month to year. Now ask yourself, how long have I been here? Neighbors carrying cocktails walk their dogs on retractable leashes, while round the cul-de-sac, a 10-year-old in training blithely jogs. You sit in the driveway, watching squirrels snack on bird feed meant for woodpeckers and doves to fortify their hurried, hungry loves. Out back, a filter roams the burbling pool. Just past dad's lot, a steel wire cattle fence tempts cows to wedge their heads through barbs and drool into his birdbath font some common sense. Their shrubby field, hemmed in by pine and palm, cushions the freeway's roar. That keeps dad calm. Come in. This shrine of white and cream and bone, whose lofted ceilings store forgotten prayers, is tranquil save for the infrequent tone of casters on the wicker dining chairs rumbling across stone tile. In rainy weather, a jigsaw puzzle slowly comes together on Carol's tabletop, while dad reclines to watch the news, his finger poised on mute. At four, she'll crack the ice, he'll pour their wines, they'll raise a toast to show how resolute the leisures of retirement can be. Heroic almost, have a glass. You'll see. True story, there is a genre of collectible antiques called trench art, which is World War I artillery shells that crafty soldiers and artisans would hammer and, and carve into keepsake bases. And this poem is about how I discovered this art form. Trench art. It spoke to me across the cluttered shop we'd wandered into. Slim and turtle brown, the vase of hammered copper was inscribed neatly in French, a single word, argon, hinting at what it was. I picked it up and recognized the shell case underside. The roomy-eyed collector of antiques grinned like a boy and with a trembling hand pointed to where the firing pin had tapped and sprayed out leaden shrapnel seeds that fanned the smoking fields. The delicate techniques that soldiers learned to whittle their huge crop of empty shells inspired a kind of awe. I saw them, young men desperate to go home, yet knowing war can't end until you win it. They picked through scrap, believing there might come from suffering, which all men undergo a trophy for one shelf with tulips in it. I wrote this next poem after learning about a colleague's death from cancer. It, uh, it describes a memory that was literally the first thing that popped into my mind. And although it's a, it's a happy memory, I tried to tinge it with an awareness of the loss. Laughing with Alice. Hearing the news that she died, I suddenly remembered how Alice and I once served on the same hiring committee. How, during a phone interview, the pretentious cadence and fluted nasal vowels of an Ivy League applicant pricked us with such an acute sense of the ridiculous, our eyes met over a tremor of giggles. Impossible to stifle, with that voice droning away, its owner so solemn, so oblivious to a giddiness now taking hold of everyone at the table, our mad laughter grew. The harder we struggled to plug it with the backs of our hands or dodge each other's incriminating gaze, the more our eyes filled with tears. Helplessly, we tried to wave away the contagion, 
each word from the speaker phone like a needle to the spine, convulsing us until with a smothered gasp and sob and complete seizure of the abdomen, we passed into that final phase of ecstasy, a rictus like a cat's yawn, the soul unable to claw its way back into the paralyzed body. Somehow Alice, though still high from the social ether, pulled herself together in time to say goodbye on behalf of the committee as we found our breath again and dabbed our eyes. During the pandemic, I would take long walks along the Milwaukee River and soon became acquainted with many species of bird there and their habits, and including the subject of this next poem. Um, for anyone unfamiliar with the word passerine, it's the zoological order that this bird belongs to. Tree swallows. Leaving their nests to feed and fly and play, the swallows begin hovering over the river at midday, white bibs with black wings, weaving in and out of one another's wakes. They call dibs on mayflies as they graze leafing willows, glide and swoop upward in a corkscrew loop-de-loop -loop to an aerial summit where they pivot into a death-defying plummet toward their shadows in the dappled water. Back and forth they flit and tease, frisky tacticians, no warier than fighter pilots scrimmaging in formation above an aircraft carrier finishing a mission. You love to watch the scamps mount pretend attacks as you wait for a precious flyby glimpse of the turquoise on their backs. Those streaks of blue, those sequins glinting like abalone shells embroidered in coattails, those dragonfly neckties skimming the surface of the afternoon with skipped stone frequencies, sound waves splashing one's body in the plink of key piano keys, coruscations like knife throws, minnows fleeing from cavernous reefs, to swallow and be swallowed. Oh, how this planet has made us idiots for beauty. Pawns and purveyors of aesthetic, if not artistic, accidents of mutation. We fall behind in making of the swallows half balletic, half ballistic circus routine, a tune or dance, a mural, a romance of language linking mind to mind. Is this why hours from now you'll sit in a chair and stare at a desktop screen repeatedly asking, is this, is this what I mean? Too aware of the danger with people living at odds in the rising smoke of half-extinguished gods, you'll create through the night, feeling your way to a river where even the blind might see the passerine advancing tree by tree. My latest project is a series of sonnets about childhood, queerness, and pop culture in the 1970s and 80s. Uh, each one is titled by the year in which it takes place. Um, I'll just read a couple to give you a flavor of what they're like. And, um, and heads up to Jason, these will be my last two poems. 1974. For Christmas, all my wishes are fulfilled. Malibu Barbie, Ken, their Lux RV. From dad's unease, I sense that he's not thrilled but nothing's going to blunt my ecstasy at handling these forbidden figurines. I love their graceful poses, plastic smell, the way my mind heats up with lurid scenes not pitched in any boardroom at Mattel. On a dark beach, Barbie and her man pledge love before their god on rubber knees, while bandits, crouching, eye their caravan from the dense shadows of surrounding trees. When boys ask me to play, I'll leave inside this outlaw Barbie world, it's best to hide. And lastly, 1977. Reading in my backyard, I'm Nancy Drew. At brunch with Ned, out driving, making time to shine a flashlight on the web of crime behind an old credenza. Oh, it's true, my hammock's sinking stretched from fence to tree, with nothing but a blotted paper plate to flag the cherry pop-tarts I just ate. But Nancy doesn't judge or hassle me. 
She's too intent on seeing life's whole truth with stoic grace a worldliness and poise that makes those milk-fed pups, the hardy boys, seem boring. Nestled with a female sleuth, I feel more at home, totally involved in mysteries that no man has ever solved. Thanks for your attention and enjoy the rest of the show. Thanks, David. That was great. Um... <laughs> the poem about your parents' house just reminded me, I always think that about my parents' house too. It got a lot nicer after I left. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Um, we'll be, <clears throat> excuse me, moving on to our next reader, our 2021 Poetry Contest Champion. Excuse me, Jennifer Fandel, whose poem, The Father, was selected as the best by contest judge Brenda Cardenas from over 700 submissions across. Did I mention 700 poems? That's a lot of poems. Um, Jennifer's poetry is forthcoming or has been published in the American Journal of Poetry, Ginger Measure, the Baltimore Review, and Rhino, as well as in a number of anthologies, including the brilliant new collection that you must go buy right now, Hope is the Thing, Wisconsinites on Perseverance in a Pandemic. It's a wonderful collection. A lot of great poets and writers represented in that collection. Um, definitely worth your time. Um, Jennifer's other published work includes book reviews and nonfiction books for children and young adults. When she's not writing or teaching poetry in women's shelters, parks and rec programs at grade schools, <gasps> Jennifer teaches at Oak Hill Correctional Institution through the Wisconsin Prison Humanities Project and tutors students in writing at Oak Hill through the Odyssey Behind Bars College Program. I'm pleased to introduce to you tonight the first place winner of the 2021 Wisconsin People and Ideas Poetry Contest, Jennifer Fandel. Hi, hi everyone. Um, I, um, I want to start by thanking um, Jason A. Smith, um, the editor who it's been just a pleasant a pleasure to work with. Um, I want to thank the contest judge, um, Brenda Cardenas, or Cardenas, sorry, um, and the, the screeners and everyone else who makes this contest possible. Um, I also want to thank all of my writer friends. Um, I know that a lot of you are out there, many of whom were the first audience for these poems. And um, you know who you are, um, many of you helped shape them. And I also just want to thank everyone in the audience for listening. Um, it really means a lot. I'll start by reading um, the winning poem first. Uh, this poem contains a dog in it, um, and it, it comes from a story that I lifted from my husband's family. My husband's great grandfather had said before he died that he would come back as a dog. And remarkably, a black dog was often seen around his favorite fishing holes. And this poem is titled The Father. Sorry, I'm just getting a few things set up. I'm not used to reading on screen. The Father. Your dead father dogs you like the white mutt that roams along the fishing holes and walks the edge of gravel roads, sometimes at a trot, most times slow, but with purpose, muscle and sinew protecting old bones. The father in silence with pipe clenched between his teeth made a fog of every place he inhabited. What did he understand of you, late arrived child, when he hoped the burdens of fatherhood were done? The white dog looks deep within you, his eyes the blue of, his, of your father's favorite Rapala. You take his poles, his tackle box, pulled shut with an old belt and sit at the shore. You cast 
and try to think past what you harbor in you, the strange alchemy of love and duty and the anger that rises from it, thick as the dog's hackles when it senses something hidden in the lake's fog. Um, I, I promise um, to you audience that my poems will eventually lighten up, um, but um, for now, this next one also has some definite um, and it's titled Proper Burial. When we turn the earth in our yard for garden, the last tenant's burials emerge as bones. Let us say some words for every creature that breathed its last, for the rabbits, birds, and squirrels, for the dog and the stray cat that came for mice and rest when the dog was gone, and the baby possum that once stewed in the scent of dirt and sleep, the insects cometh and the moles that shrugged off the little life left in them removed from their steely traps. My grandmother refused to be buried in the Catholic cemetery because of a gopher problem and laid her money down for a municipal plot. Digging up bones picked clean, I understand. Last spring, Arctic air swept the plains and a foot of snow fell after the robins had arrived, the worms shrinking below the refrozen soil. My husband found a robin laying in the snow and thought he felt the heart still beating, the bird's dark eye frozen open. He carried the robin inside, lay its body in a shoebox under a scrap of wool, as if a bed tucked into. Um, and um, this next one has both fishing and death in it. Um, I will say that the pandemic did lead to to some added time um, watching public television. Um, so it's okay because it was educational. Um, and I had watched the Hemingway biography and um, didn't know really much about his last years until I had watched that and how terrible those last years were. This poem is titled, Fishing with My Father. He would, he would not have used the word unequivocal to describe the sky, one cloud parsing itself into a heart, old and beating, dark gray bottom filled with storm. That's my word for a day of flannel and wool our boat drifting along the riffles the wind made on the lake, our cast fast against the chill in our bones. He approached his task as if he were young again, impatiently patient for the lurch of the muscalunge, a fish so tough to catch that a snag felt as close to death as birth. He did not speak. I did not speak. Here was a man turning towards sunset, and I could only imagine this tough and beautiful world going down with him. Okay, I I am going to go a little bit lighter. Um, one of the other educational television experiences I had over the pandemic was watching this old, I think, BBC program called The Time Team um, that my husband had discovered on YouTube. 
Um, in it, an archaeology team has just four days to do a dig and figure out what had happened in specific sites. Also, I grew up on a dead end street that when we first moved there had two condemned houses on it. Um, so there's always been something intriguing to me about looking at a landscape and knowing what was there before. And this poem is titled Archaeology. There had been a homestead near. See the neat rows of daffodils that likely lined the frame. The impenetrable thicket of lilac whose scent presses the sky. Move closer and you might trip over remnants of a concrete step or a claw foot from a cast iron tub, which reminds me of a man whose heart was a sponge of poetry, soaked up, easily wrung. As a student, he rented a room in a house his teacher and wife owned, and he heard their nightly fights and wondered what love was. One day, the wife called the student to the bathroom where she sat soaking in the tub, her skin candlelit. The house might still be there in the small college house that welcomed the dreams of everyone foolish enough to believe in them. Marriages ended there love affairs started and his mind was a wreckage found abandoned in a field daffodils surrounding its edges lilacs longing for the sky and i will read my sorry my my final poem um uh, my final poem was inspired, there, there are some weird sort of pandemic connections in a lot of these poems. Um, and this final poem was inspired by a family member who was troubling me. In the pre-vaccination times of COVID, this person was going out to the tavern and she was in her late 80s. Um, this was something that confounded me, um, but then I thought about my own experiences in bars, and I will give a shout out to the joint in Eau Claire, Wisconsin, um, and I, I kind of came around. Um, and side note, I, um, I was raised Catholic, and I love a lot of the language of Catholicism um, from which this poem takes its title. The poem is titled, The Communion of Saints. Everyone who rises after death knows that heaven is a tavern. From outside, the heady wonder of lights beckons you in and you recognize the bodies you brush past in entering, angels, all the spirits buzzing. A bartender who knew you in younger years catches your eye, mixes you a whiskey sour. Next to you at the bar rail, a woman laughs, leave my tab open. Slumped on a stool, a man strains to see visions in his glass through the dance of melting ice and scotch. As you weave through the crowd, people ask, you new here? Lean in to catch their words, the breath on your face. You are here with no one and everyone. And when you meet someone's eye, you know you kissed them in a prior life. Leave your body's heaviness behind. A girl who might have once been you sways at the jukebox, 
paging the songbook, searching for the right voice to float by. Possibility shifts like ice unsettling itself, like the head of beer sucked, saved from spilling over. In the lit dartboard, the arrows wait in the bullseye. All night, the party never ends. And even when it filters out to a cold, dark street, people hugging, the soul stay with you. You know the direction home, but you are already there. The night spread before you, infinite and whole, with the protection of light poured bright as a drink around you. And thank you, Jennifer. Um, yeah, heaven is a tavern. Uh, for, for those of you joining us who aren't from Wisconsin, a tavern's a bar. <laughs> um, and um, and yeah, especially in these COVID times, to think about that is is very nice. I'd, I'd actually amend Jennifer's poem and say heaven is the plaza tavern. This is a tavern <laughs> in Madison. Um, but um, I'm happy happy to hear that. Thank thank you, Jennifer. That was wonderful. Um, I'm so pleased to have you here with us tonight. Um, I'd like to thank all of our poetry contest winners for sharing their work with us tonight. You can you can read some of the poems they shared tonight in the new issue of Wisconsin People Ideas Magazine. Here's the print version. The online version will be posted shortly. But if you just can't wait go to Overture Center up on the third floor of the James Watrous Gallery, which is the Academy's Gallery, has these on a rack out front. You can pick one up for yourself when you're downtown. Um, it, it'll be worth your time. This is an excellent issue. Um, okay, so we're gonna move on to our fiction readers now, beginning with our 2021 third place contest winning story, Protocol of Print. Now, Eau, Claire, Eau Claire author, this is fruit flying here or something. Eau Claire author Yvette Vietz Flayton uh, uh, wrote this story. It's a great story. Um, she's going to read from it uh, tonight. Uh, Yvette was born in Denver, Colorado and grew up in, in an Air Force family living in Nevada, North Dakota and Washington State as well as France, England and Spain. Yvette holds a Bachelor of Arts in Spanish and a Master in, of Arts in History from UW Eau Claire. Um, her award-winning poetry has appeared in numerous journals, and her pandemic short story, La Pestilencia, appeared in the June 2020 issue of the London Reader, and her short story, Unforgiving Winter, won second place in the 2020 Lake Fly Flash Fiction Contest. And where's the Lake Fly Contest out of? It's in Wisconsin, right? Right. Oshkosh. 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 Great. Okay. Everybody, welcome. Yvette. Take it away, Yvette. Thank you. Thank you. I have to say, um, as much as I like to write poetry, I love to go back and, and uh, write fiction too. And this one for me is a real stretch because I've never written before uh, science fiction. Um, I never dabbled in it. I have friends who do. And all of a sudden I decided, what the heck, I'll try um, a dystopian look at life. So here's my story, and I'm going to read excerpts. I'll, I will read about four pages of the beginning and then jump ahead, and, but I will not read the end because I would like people to seek it out and, and enjoy it um, the way I hope they will. So protocol of print. Oh, one more thing. Um, the, t the character, the main character, her name is Jealous, but it's not Jealous like Jealousy. It's Jealous, J-E-L-I-S, Jealous. Protocol of print. Jealous stopped digging. She shrugged her harness off, letting the old fashioned exo shoveler drop to the ground. Who cares anyway? It was obsolete. It only moved up and down and then only a maximum of 15 inches. It had no other action, no reverse, no side to side, no voice control, just an on and off button on the belt. You couldn't find an older, more worthless model if you dug in the hardware pits for a year. Brighthorn crackled to life. Jealous, what is the problem? 
Jealous looked up at the drone floating above her, performing its standard figure eight float. Rumor had it that its flight pattern was based on bees, but no one could be sure of that anymore. Now pollination was done by bees, botanical eugenical apian synchronates or something like that. Anyway, Jealous glared up at Brighthorn. It's caught on something. I got to dig on my own. Okay, aloud. With a whir, Brighthorn lifted off back up to its 150 foot altitude cap. Only the state's big eye could go up higher, up to a thousand feet. Beyond that, it was Homeland's secure awk, and that was something else entirely. You didn't want one of those breathing down your neck, not for anything. They were nasty, but Brighthorn, they were still manned locally and they weren't lethal. And although the voice was modulated, it could be someone from your own community running the joystick. Someone maybe that you ate with or someone you slept with. Who knew? Who cares, Jealous thought. She edged her way down into the pit, careful not to slip. These pits were gold mines. So rumor had it, back in the day, as the teachers like to say, being dramatic, way back when, when back in the warrior century, people did not refit. Hard to believe. No one refitted at all. Everything went to the place they called the dump. It took seven PhDs to figure out that wasn't an anacronym. Turned out it was just a noun from a verb. Jealous scrunched down. The shoveler's blade was caught on something. She Ugger. Jealous morphed the curse word into an AB, an acceptable blaspheme. She didn't want Brighthorn to pick up her word. She was trying hard not to get additional time added to her probation by breaking any more civil rules. It was a constant struggle. Obedience didn't come easy for her. Too much like her mother, she figured. Way too much. Impatience in line, cursing, disrespect of superiors, interrupting superiors, counter walking on public ways, theft from society. For Christ's sake, she had shouted at the court officer, it was two pennies on the treadway. Her six months for theft from society was extended to a year for aggressive disrespect of an official. And she was off to pit number 4459-3299. So I'm gonna skip ahead a little bit. You can see where this is going. So she has to ask the Brighthorn for help. So she asks, please, I would like to request the use of a blade, a knife specifically, Jealous F. Russo, section eight, pit 44593299, thank you. And the voice replies, I've already dispatched Racer your way. Good job, Jealous. Good form. You're learning. Good job. Brighthorn buzzed up and away. Racer arrived in his yellow coverall, his tool belt riding jaunty on his hips, the makings of a carb gut starting to hang over the front buckle. He was this dig's EO, equipment officer, one of the triumphs who oversaw the whole remote. The others were the production officer and the social officer, who never came out to the pit itself, staying in their quads day and night for the most part, running the show while never seeing the show, doing everything from a handheld. They would die in the heat of the pit in high summer, Jealous was pretty sure. Racer, on the other hand, even if she didn't like him, at least he knew where the pit was. And like now, standing above her section on the rim, he got to experience the rising pit plume full bore. Hey, Jelly Baby, what's up? What can old Racer do you for? He smirked at her, pleased with himself and his H. Wood glibness. Oh, he likes old Hollywood movies and watches uh, them from the centuries before to get the lingo down. I need a knife. I'm hung up on a milk jug. jug. Again? You must look for them, Jealous. 
A little further on. Ready, jealous? Racer asked, that eyebrow arching again. She nodded. He let go of his grip. Slowly, she turned to the offending milk jug. Remember, he cautioned, everything you touch, everything you do is being scanned. It's on my record too, you know. Capiche, jelly baby? Jealous nodded. She squatted down and drove the eight inch blade into the belly of the milk jug. Three things happened at once. The milk jug, which still had some residual casein inside, sheared apart into three sweet pieces, releasing the shoveler's blade. Racer's recorder started an oscillating warning tone and State's big eye suddenly dropped, drone suddenly dropped down and zoomed back and forth across the entire pit, its strobes pulsing, its loud voice announcing, alert, alert, incoming meteorological attack, alert, alert, take cover now, take cover now. Racer turned away from Jealous, hunching his recorder inside his overall collar, trying to hear his message. Then he was shouting back into the recorder urgently and starting to climb up out of the pit. He looked back toward Jealous once. Hail, he shouted, get back to your Connie. He disappeared over the rim. Jealous stood still. Racer had not waited to secure his knife. The rain was already starting, hard rain. Storms like this came up out of nowhere, dangerous and unpredictable. It was time to go. Jealous reached down to grab the shoveler's harness with her free hand, but she slipped falling backward and then slid down on the thick clay past the milk jug toward the bottom. No, she shouted out in sudden panic. The pits filled with water quickly in an attack. She had to get back up to the rim or she could drown. Her foot hit something, stopping her slide. She reached for it, something black, an old fashioned garbage bag tied with a knot. Yeah, tied with an old time simple overhand knot. There were a lot of these in the pit still, tons of them. This pit had so many that the archeos had said they didn't want any more reports unless the cash was really something. The refitters could take a look and decide, unofficially, of course. In desperation, Jealous held onto the knot, pulling herself up with one hand, digging the knife into the thick soil with the other, she was struggling to stand up just as the sky went darker and the rain began to change. It turned suddenly cold and icy, stinging her hands. She could feel the drops growing larger, striking her back and shoulders on the top of her headpiece. Suddenly, a small tear began in the bag, opening just below where Jealous's fingers had dug into it, below the knot. She tightened her hand, her hold, and the bag came loose from the soil. She slipped going down on one knee. She caught her breath. Through the tear, she could see a square corner, some sort of pattern, the unmistakable edge of the brick-like compression of papers stacked together. No wonder the bag was so heavy. No wonder it was like an anchor on this slippery slope to the abyss below. She had found a bag of books. And I'm gonna stop there. It's the perfect place to end. Um, and I encourage uh, all the listeners and uh, future readers to, to find out what happens. And I would like to thank the Academy and the Book Festival and all the listeners for tuning in. This is a great, great honor. Thank you. Thanks Yvette. Um right now you probably can't hear it but upstairs my wife is reading stories to our kids getting them ready for bed and you know needless to say the importance of books um and the event story um you can read all about it i'm not gonna even gonna tell you i'm not gonna say anymore um in the uh spring 2022 issue of wisconsin people and ideas will feature event stories so you're gonna have to Stay tuned until then. Thanks very much, Yvette. Yes, Appreciate thank you it. very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Um, there's a lot of great world building going on in these stories that won this year. And um, Kim Sur's story, Everything Burns, is no exception. Kim won second place. 
in this year's fiction contest. Kim's the author of Nothing to Lose, a recent collection of short stories published by Cornerstone Press, um, which is based in Stevens Point. Great press. I, I recommend checking them out. Good Wisconsin Press. And she's also author of the wonderfully titled Maybe I'll Learn, Snapshots of a Novice Mom. Kim, owns a, uh, Kim holds an MFA in fiction from the Solstice Program at Pine Manor College, where she was the Dennis Lehane Fellow in 2013. Her writing has appeared in various publications, including ours, Wisconsin People Ideas. And some of you might recognize Kim as the director of Red Oak Writing, where she leads writers roundtable critique groups. Woo, woo, yep. Um, provides manuscript critiques and coaching and leads the summer creative writing camp for camps for youth. When Kim isn't writing, whenever that is, um, she enjoys reading, gardening, time outdoors with her family, and being a fangirl for her, her own grown children in their various pursuits. Please welcome Kim Sawyer. Thank you, Jason. Um, uh, so my, my line was going to be thank, to begin by thanking the Academy, but I would like to thank the Academy. And also, um, echo my gratitude for Jason and Connor and the ad admirable way that they support writers across the, the state and, and, um, and books and reading. It's just, it's really wonderful. I'd also like to thank Chris Fink, um, the judge for the fiction category and kudos to the others um, reading tonight and, um, and Paula as well. Um, I'm really honored to be among you. And um, also many thanks to my friends and colleagues who are here to cheer us all on. It's exciting to be here tonight. Um, as background for the excerpts I'm about to read, many years ago, I heard a story on NPR uh, that featured the lectors who read to rollers in Cuban cigar factories while they work. And they read the newspaper cover to cover in the morning and literature in the afternoon. And I was just enamored with the idea of these manual labors who, quite frankly, are probably better informed and well-read than I am. And I set about writing a series of stories that all connected in some way to a cigar factory in Cuba and the lectora who read to the workers there. Um, a couple of the stories have been published and a number of them are still in the works waiting to reveal their hearts to me. Tonight, I'm going to read the beginning of one of them titled Everything Burns. And it begins with an epigram from um, La Baya Mesa, which was written by Sindo Garay. In her soul, the Bayamo woman carries sad memories of old traditions. When she looks at her green pastures, tears well up in her eyes. She is simple. She offers mankind all virtues and her heart. But if she hears her homelands cry, she drops everything. She burns everything. That is her life, her religion. Before I step through the doors of the cigar factory, I smell the aroma that has followed my younger sister home since she started working here. Inside, it is as if someone has turned off the lights. Slowly, I start to make out the figures of rollers already at their work tables. May I help you? A cold voice asks. I did not see the man sitting at the table next to the door. I am Ernesto Lopez Famosa. I step toward the table, but see no recognition on his face. Rosario's brother? A snort escapes him. This is not an unusual reaction. I've experienced a version of it since the moment Rosario was born. Longer, really, since before that, no one would believe that with my olive skin, dark eyes and hair, I could be fair, green-eyed Esmeralda's son either. Usually, if I do not respond, if I look patiently at the doubter, he will eventually see the resemblance. Rosario and I both have one droopy eye and high cheekbones. Those who have known us for a long time wonder why they did not see the resemblance sooner. You two are the spitting image of your mother, they finally say. The man at the table, however, is not so observant. No, tell the truth, who are you? Apparently I must be direct. My sister is Rosario Fernandez Famosa. She must stay home to care for our mother. I pull a slip of paper from my pocket. I put extra politeness in my voice. The supervisor said I may take her place. He looks at the slip of paper and leads me to a messy office with a window that looks out over the workers. Senor, this is Ernesto. He says he is Rosario's brother. If the supervisor is surprised, he does not show it, but reaches across, to, across his desk. His hand is warm and so are his eyes. Sit down, he gestures to a chair. Alejandro, stay with us a moment. 
At your service, I sit. I appreciate this opportunity. It means much to our family that we will not lose the salary, especially with Mama's accident. See, si, see, si, he tisks. Such a shame. How is she? Well, we are grateful she is alive, but she needs constant care. I slide my eyes to Alejandro to see if any sympathy surfaces. None. Thank you for asking. Of course, of course. We will miss Rosario, but it is right that she stay home. He writes on a card and hands it to me. He has drawn a line through her name and written mine above. Alejandro, find Manuel and tell him to teach Ernesto how to roll. We stand. It takes a while to get the knack, but if you are even half the roller Rosario was, you will be fine. The respect in his voice surprises me. I thank him again and follow Alejandro to an empty chair in the midst of the other rollers. Their hands deftly smooth brown tobacco leaves, layering, rolling, measuring, cutting. I try to imagine Rosario with her damaged hand doing this work and wonder what secret trick she used to become one of the best rollers in the factory. If she had a trick, she did not reveal it to me while she tried to give me advice. Do everything Manuel tells you, she said, and he will make sure you get the best leaves. Not too moist, not too dry. It all begins with the best leaves. She said nothing about what to do once the leaves are in front of me. I watch the speed and precision of the other workers and regret that the only thing I've taught my own hand to do is drag a pen across a sheet of paper in hopes of becoming one of the next important Cuban writers. Mama has fed this dream. Perhaps she created it in the first place, telling me ever expanding stories of my father and his beautiful words. Rosario's brother, eh? The gruff voice must be Manuel's. I move to stand up. Sit, he reaches for a leaf. Rosario got this quick. I slide my chair to make room for the mountain of a man. He talks through each step. By the time he asks, any questions? I do not have the courage to say, could you please show me again? I'll check on you in a while, he says over his shoulder and is gone. I try to be unobtrusive as I watch the others work. They offer quiet smiles and brief words of welcome, but generally seem lost in the dance of their hands. Perhaps they don't want to talk over La Lectora, who reads the newspaper into a microphone, or they assume my presence in Rosario's seat imbues me with her skill. Either way, no one offers instruction and I do not ask. By the time La Lectora has finished the news, I have rolled five cigars that look like skinny dog droppings. No, 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 Manuel takes the cigar from my hand. There is no way this will stay lit. He tosses the cigar into the basket for waste. Don't you know how fire works, kid? I know all too well how fire works, but that is beside the point. Please show me again. After the two tight cigars comes a series of two loose ones. Manuel must have decided I'm thick in the head. He speaks slowly and a little louder than normal. He demonstrates again. When the tobacco is too loose, you get a fire hazard. He flicks his lighter, keeping the cigar away from his face as he lights it. Instinctively, I stand to evade the flame. My chair tumbles to the floor. Manuel laughs. Hernandez, put that thing out, bellows a voice. The others in our area stop their rolling to chuckle and comment. Come on, well, give the kid a break. Don't worry, Mano, you'll get the touch. You should have seen how loose mine were when I started out. Manuel faces me so I can read his lips, smell his tired breath. Too much oxygen surrounds the tobacco leaves, makes a fire hazard. He throws the flaming cigar to the cement floor and puts it out with a step of his boot. I fan the smoke from the air around us. His point made, Manuel's eyes find mine and soften a bit. Okay, Rosario's brother, let's try again. He sits and rolls three more cigars in front of me, slowly. He holds each one up to my face, then puts the last one in my left hand. Compare it to your finger. He squeezes my middle finger. You, maybe your thumb. He hands me another leaf. You'll get it. He doesn't say that Rosario is better at this than I will ever be. Mi corazón, like this. I am four years old and sit on my mama's, mama's lap. Her hand is wrapped around mine, which is wrapped around a pencil. Make a loop here, she says. That will make a B instead of a P. See, like magic. Rosario lies in her crib. Waving her arms and legs in the air, she looks like a pale cockroach, and I tell Mama so. She claps her hands. You are so imaginative. You will be a famous writer one day. 
I can't imagine how this making of letters could make me famous, but I do feel the love it stirs in Mama, so I hold the pencil tighter and concentrate. Maybe if I make my writing good enough, it will take away her sadness when she looks at the portrait of my father. Maybe it will soften her face when she rocks my fussy sister. Do not disappoint me, Mama would, would often say. Your father was driven from this country because of his writing. Now you must be his voice. After two more days of wasted tobacco, Manuel puts his hand on my shoulder. Old Orestes doesn't have much time left. Why don't you go sit with him for a while? Learn the ropes. I don't know what old Orestes does at the table in the back of the factory. It seems he packs boxes and then passes them on to Enrique before they go into shipping crates. But just as there is much more to hand rolling a cigar, there must be more to old Oreste's job than it appears. He grabs a handful of cigars and using a formula only he seems to know, he pulls two or three from the bunch, places them into a box on his right and sets the others aside. The next handful yields four cigars acceptable for the box. As someone who likes puzzles, I am transfixed trying to figure out what criteria, criteria he uses to select or deselect the cigars. At first, I guess it has to do with their circumference, but as far as I can tell, the ones he has not chosen are exactly the same as the same size as the ones he has. I measure a couple against my thumb to make sure. It might be related to the aroma because he holds them so close to his face, but when I look closer, I can tell he is not sniffing them as I have seen the aficionados in the smoking ritual do. Figured it out yet? His smile shows a darkened tooth. I shrug. Keep watching. He holds up a handful of cigars and chooses one. As I watch him work, my mind drifts to Rosario. How can I admit to her that I've been demoted to watching an old man use a mystery formula to fill cigar boxes at the back of the factory? Perhaps there is no secret to his work. Perhaps this busy work is simply to give structure to an old man's days. If so, what does that say about me? I can hardly ask Rosario without giving away my diminished status admitting to her that she's better at something than I am. Ernesto, what are you doing? You will burn the house down. I am eight years old and standing over the gas burner with a piece of bread turning black and smoking at the end of a fork. Mama's hair looks like laundry left on a line in a rain shower and there are dark smudges under her eyes. The first time she has left her bed in three days. Then she sees the toast. Oh, Ernesto, such a waste. She turns off the burner, puts the charred bread on a plate. Plain bread for you. I will eat this later. She notices Rosario's silent tears. It's okay. Everything is okay now. She turns to me. Did you give your sister breakfast? I have been giving my sister breakfast my whole life, it feels like. Quiet as corpses, you two. I'm going back to bed. She kisses us each on the forehead. No more toast. Okay, now you try it. Orestes holds up a handful of cigars in front of my face. Look at what is already in the box. I follow his order. Now, which ones will join them? I concentrate, trying to discern size, shape, texture, anything that will give me a clue. I'll give you a hint. Three of these will make the grade. How he can see through those cloudy eyes, I will never know. I squint. My vision goes out of focus and I discover his secret. Being half blind is an asset. I can now see that three of the cigars are the exact shade of brown as the others already in the box. Uniform color as well as size and shape must be important. I gently pull the three cigars from his fist and lay them in the box. Aha! His deep laugh relaxes my jaw. The first thing I have gotten right all day. I take a breath to begin to ask how he is able to do his work so fast. Shh! He turns his face toward La Lectora. She is back from her break. Distracted by my own incompetence, I had lost awareness of La Lectora's reading, but now I see that Orestes has been listening, anticipating her return to the microphone. Quiet now, she left off at a good part. He puts a box in front of me, signals I should get to work. I am concentrating too hard on the cigars to listen to the story, but it must be compelling because Orestes lets out an occasional grunt and sometimes stops for a moment, cigars suspended in front of his face as he gazes into a distance I cannot see. By the time she closes the book and turns off the microphone, I have filled five boxes to Orestes 15. Still, he smiles. Yes, Rosario's brother, he pats my shoulder. You will work out just fine. Thank you.
Thanks, Kim, for sharing that story. Um, Everything Burns will show up in the winter 2022 edition of Wisconsin People Ideas Magazine, which should be out at the end of January next year. So it's coming up very soon. So we're looking forward to seeing that whole story in the magazine. Thank Thanks you. Again, Kim. That was Thank great. you. So I'm pleased to have with us tonight the first place winner of our 2021 fiction contest, Allison Uselman, who will read to us from her story, Honor Cord, um, which is in this issue of the magazine. And Allison was kind enough to actually do the illustration for her own story, which is fabulous, getting to know Violet Wells in a couple of different ways. Um, Allison was born and raised, and she currently lives in Madison. Violet Wells is the main character. Um, of honor court. Um, Allison attended Augsburg University in Minneapolis, Minnesota, where she graduated in 2019 with a degree in English and a studio art minor. In her free time, Allison likes to draw, bike, and watch MASH reruns and snuggles her dog, George, um, which we may, may or may not see tonight. Um, she hopes to one day attend art school somewhere near the ocean where she can continue drawing baby animals, wildflowers, and self-described pouty self-portraits. Um, we're going to let her tell us what that means. I'm pleased to welcome to the Wisconsin Book Festival, 2021 Wisconsin Book Festival, the winner of the 2021 Wisconsin People Ideas Fiction Contest, Allison Uselman. Okay, thank you. Um, just kind of piggybacking off of what everybody else said. Thank you to the judges and everybody for putting this together and uh, to everyone watching. So also happy birthday to my mom. She's at home watching. Um, and thank you for postponing your celebration until tomorrow. And I hope you're enjoying your frozen pizza. Um, so I'm just going to read the first few pages of my story, um, but to give some context for it, um, I wrote it like last winter, spring, kind of around then, and I was spending a lot of time at the library, and I got this book um, about prairies from, I think it was like PBS or something, and uh, I just kept rereading it and I got kind of obsessed with this idea of prairie fires um, and just kind of was inspired by the images of that. So that's kind of what inspired the story and the opening of it. So I'm just gonna read a few pages. It was not a hick town, but rather a prairie town, one where there was often nothing for young people to do, but drive around and attempt to reckon with the vastness of the land. The prairies, for example, made Violet Wells feel small. The grasses were high and pale, the flowers ragged the way prairie plants must be in order to survive. The fires that occasionally swept across the land were brilliant and terrifying in their ability to destroy. Standing on the side of the road, the car parked just behind her, Violet closed her eyes, listened to the rush of the wind in the grasses, and threw up. Jesus, she imagined Buddy saying to her through the open passenger side window of the car. What's that about? She put her hands on her knees and spit onto the ground, watching the saliva sink into the grass. She breathed in once before turning to look at the car. The prairie was reflected in the back window and she imagined the sun was a fire burning through it. She had heard the prairie fires were not always bad, that they burned the matted down and dead grasses and let the sun reach the soil again. They kept trees and shrubs from growing and taking over the grasses. They killed invasive species. Did you know wildfires are sometimes good, she imagined saying to Buddy. They refresh the land or something like that. Violet imagined him looking cautiously between the vomit on the ground and herself. I guess he would say. They also kill things. When there are fires that burn too long or too often, too many things die. Imaginary Buddy coughed and made a motion for her to get back into the car and drive. She did, imagining on the road as they drove, the same lines of fire burning that she imagined on her ceiling at night. Paths of fire across the paint, blown across the prairie by the wind. They always burned clear until morning, sometimes burning all throughout the next day and the next. There were no cities, no highways, no people on her ceiling. There was only prairie. Buddy would not understand this, imaginary or not. She could see him slapping his knees, saying, I'm sure there's nothing to worry about if that's why you heaved back there. Violet clicked her teeth together. Her mouth tasted like old orange candy and her throat felt hot. She felt dizzy. 
Out in the grass, the cicadas chirped and the sun began setting all pink in the sky. I'm sure there's nothing to worry about. She shook her head trying to get the image of Carolyn Braumer walking through the parking lot on graduation night out of her brain. By the time she was back in town, the dizzy feeling had left and was replaced by the sort of calm that comes at night in the summer. She drove past Wayne's, the open sign glowing in the window, kids on the bench outside licking ice cream cones. What do you think she's going to do, Violet asked imag imaginary Buddy. Carolyn, I mean. About what, Buddy said. Even in Violet's imagination, he was oblivious. About what happened? Imaginary Buddy shook his head. You don't even know that anything did happen to her. You saw her walking, that's it. Violet clenched the wheel as she braked. The light had not yet fully turned red, but she stopped anyway at the yellow. Something happened, she said out loud. I just know it. She rounded the next corner and went the back way around the high school. In summer, it was humid and the sun beat down on the wrought iron fence surrounding the athletic fields. In June, July, August, the fence's metallic sheen burned, and in the winter, it seemed cold enough to freeze your skin. It was on the back part of the fence, the part pressed up against the woods that separated the high school grounds from Wayne's, where Violet got the scar on the back of her thigh. Long and white, the scar was a thin reminder of the afternoon she and Buddy had climbed the fence as a shortcut to the park behind the school. I don't want to walk all the way to the gate, Buddy had said, so they hopped the fence. Violet had slipped and the fence had caught the back of her leg. She'd gotten stitches and Buddy carried her all the way home, forgetting all about the park or the rest of the afternoon. You were very brave, Mrs. Wells told her daughter, and Mr. Wells clapped Buddy on the back and thanked him. She lifted one leg and then the other as she drove, unsticking her skin from the leather seat of the car. She rarely thought about the scar anymore, except for when she was unsticking her skin from leather seats or plastic chairs or metal piers. Then she imagined her leg lifting away and the scar remaining on whatever surface from which she had just attached herself. She wanted to pick the scar up and hold it in her hands like a caterpillar. Imaginary Buddy read her mind and shivered. It happened on graduation night after the ceremony was over. At first it hadn't bothered her. It never even occurred to her that something was odd about seeing Carolyn Braumer walking across the parking lot in the dark. Shoes in one hand, graduation gown wadded into a ball in the other. Violet herself was doing the same thing, walking home. In the back of the lot by the tennis courts in the field that led to the small strip of woods, assistant coach Michael's truck was parked. It was silver and shiny, even in the dark, and it had stood out rather well as it was the only vehicle in the lot. She hadn't thought too much of it at the time and instead nodded her head and said hello to Carolyn, but Carolyn had just kept walking. The lights in the school were on, but then they were always on. They burned all night long, all year long, an outrageous energy bill racked up in an attempt to protect the building from vandalism and prowlers. It was later that night after she lay down in bed and pulled the top sheet up to her chin that a tightening feeling in Violet's chest arose. She thought she'd seen a bruise on Carolyn's upper arm, but when she played the scene back in her mind, she could not be sure. Was it a shadow cast by the school, a trick of the light? She watched the prairies burn on the ceiling until she fell asleep. When Carolyn pulled her aside outside Wayne's a week later, Violet looked for the bruise. I wanted to say hi, Carolyn said. After graduation in the parking lot, I was so tired. I just had to get home. I came by to say hi now. Violet nodded and ran her fingers over the brick on the outside of the ice cream shop. Carolyn was wearing a pale yellow t-shirt whose sleeves came high enough for Violet to see a red and purple mark on her upper arm. Hi, Violet said. The two stood in silence for a moment. Carolyn hitched her purse up to her shoulder. Did you have a nice time at the ceremony, Carolyn said. Her voice seemed to waver. Fine, it was fine. The speeches were nice. A car on the street honked and both girls turned. You should have come with Buddy and me, Violet said, and then regretted it. They were not really friends, she and Carolyn. We walked around the lake and he brought some beers. That sounds nice. It was. An image of the silver truck in the parking lot flashed across Violet's mind. Suddenly brave, she asked what Carolyn had been doing at the school. Carolyn looked towards the road and then looked back. What were you doing there, she said, forcing a laugh. The girls smiled at one another. A father and two children pushed through the door to Wayne's and then Carolyn left. I have to get home, she said. It was 3.45, but Violet did not say anything about it. Poor Ellen Smith, how was she found? Shot through the heart, lying dead on the ground. So I poisoned that dear little girl on the banks below. Met her on the mountain, there I took her life. Met her on the mountain, stabbed her with my knife. Song lyrics in the American folk song book Violet's mother had bought for a dollar at the Goodwill. 
Violet had walked past the songbook placed on top of the piano in the front room nearly a thousand times, paying no attention to the stories inside for most of her life to what they were really about. The songs, in fact, were based on real stories, stories passed down from generation to generation. Alterations had been made to the dates and names and details of the original stories, and there were fragments of truth that were lost to history now, but ultimately Violet knew that the stories were true and they were all the same story. Boy meets girl, boy kills girl. In mid-July, Violet decided she was tired of sad stories and put the songbook inside the piano bench where she couldn't see it anymore. Goodbye, she said, closing the lid. That night, she drove around the town with the windows down, observing. The air was cooling as the sun set, and she rested her arm on the open window of the car. There wasn't anything good playing on the radio, so she turned the music off and listened to the whooshing sound the air made as she flew through it. She thought of graduation night and how by the time the sun came up, all the excitement of the ceremony had worn off. Buddy had pulled the tassel off his cap and spun it around on his finger, whooping and shouting into the night. She had covered his mouth with her hand, and when he licked her palm, she shrieked, and the porch lights on the house across the street flicked on. The two of them had run down the street, the lake glowing a deep blue, and she felt as if the sun would never come up and her mother and father would wait patiently forever for her to come home. When she went to sleep that morning, the sun rising bright and orange on the horizon, she left her gown in a heap on the floor. Her stomach hurt from the warm beers they had drunk, and she felt bad about not coming home sooner. Poor Ellen Smith, she said, staring at the ceiling. It's an idyllic day today, isn't it idyllic, Buddy said. They were up on the bluffs looking down at the lake below. Idyllic had been an ACT word, a joke, a word Violet could not imagine herself ever actually using. Buddy pointed down to the kayakers and the fishing boats. Do you think they can see us up here, he said. Up on the bluffs, you could see for miles, could see the trees and the lake and the buildings and all the little parking lots that dotted the town. Violet did not know if you could see up on the bluffs from any of those places. It had never occurred to her to look. No, she said, the bluffs are too tall. It only took a moment for her to find the high school and its parking lot. From so far away, she could not see it in any real detail. The school looked like a beige brick with an expanse of green on one side and black top on the other. Violet knew suddenly what she wanted to do and she imagined being brave enough to speak it. I want to break into the school, she would say, if she were brave enough. I want to go to the assistant coach's office. I have to see if there's evidence. Buddy would blink his big dumb eyes knowing to what she was referring and nod. He would look like Scout Finch in the movie of To Kill a Mockingbird when she first sees and knows Boo Radley hiding behind the door. I'm in, he would say, and he would kick his legs out into the grass. And then I'm going to stop there. Thanks, Allison. Um, you'll have to read, did I mention? It's in here. You'll have to read the new issue of Wisconsin People Ideas Magazine to see what happens to Violet Wells and what happened to Carolyn Brommer. We don't know. Um, but you can find out in here or you can find it online. It should be posted in about a week or so. Um, thanks so much, Allison. And, and with that concludes our 2021 Wisconsin Book Festival reading. Um, all the, the poems and stories that you've heard tonight not all of them, but the, the award-winning ones can be found in the magazine and online at wisconsinacademy.org slash magazine. And for all you Wisconsin writers out there, keep in mind that our 2022 Fiction and Poetry Contest open on January 15th. For contest guidelines or to submit online, visit wisconsinacademy.org slash contests. My thanks again to our readers tonight, our contest judges and sponsors and to our host, the Wisconsin Book Festival. Thanks for participating in tonight's reading and enjoy the rest of the Wisconsin Book Festival. Have a lovely evening. Thanks. <laughs>